Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, we're gonna work on repairing this, a Commodore 64, with this, another inexpensive oscilloscope. I think this one's about 80 bucks, so it's a little bit more expensive, but I think, well, it's an Oon, which is the first time I've worked on one of these on the channel, and I think it's supposed to be a little bit capable, a little bit more than some of the scopes I've used recently on the channel fixing Commodore 64s. So without further ado, let's get right to it. Okay, here we have it, the next inexpensive scope on the channel. I kind of uh, have started a thing here where I review these inexpensive scopes and at the same time I fix a Commodore 64. I'm doing that because basically I wanna show that these inexpensive scopes are definitely not high end and they're not super capable, but they are good enough for fixing very simple 8-bit computers like the Commodore 64. Same would apply, of course, to other types of machines like the Atari or Apple IIs, things that are a few megahertz in speed and just use normal TTL 5 volt levels. The last scope that I reviewed on the channel was a standalone scope, meaning it was battery powered and you didn't need a computer to, to use it. Now, the interesting thing about that particular scope was that it had a composite video output. So even though it had a really small screen, you could plug it into a large monitor or your computer through a video capture device and actually get a blown up image that was a little bit easier to use. Uh, not to spoil that video, but the oscilloscope was shockingly capable, far more than I would have thought. Now this is the oscilloscope I'm gonna be reviewing today, and as we can see by the uh, USB cable here, it is a USB scope and requires a computer for it to work. I don't think it would work with a tablet or a phone, but any laptop, old or new, should be good enough. Now right off the bat, I'm noticing <laughs> the USB cable is A to A, A to A. That, that is completely crap. That is non-standard and obviously you can see there are three jacks here and that would be because I think that this scope may require more power than the normal 500 milliamps that a regular USB port can uh, supply. <laughs> I really take issue for manufacturers for doing this kind of stuff. It is non-standard and it is unnecessary. Now the scope is probably an older design and been around a long time, which is why it's not using USB Type-C, but USB Type-C would be a great redesign on, and it would obviously allow this thing to draw as much current as is necessary. I think before I look at this any further, let's take a look at how much I paid for this scope and the different versions that are available. Here's the listing on AliExpress. This is the actual store that I bought it from, and it looks like it's $80 right now, including shipping. This is US dollars. Now, the version I bought uh, that's right here on the bench is actually the I version, which is showing $110 right now. I went back and looked at my orders, and here it is. I paid $108.88, so I guess about $2 less. Now, the difference between these two and the reason for the price increase is the I version, the one that I bought here, is actually isolated. That's what the I stands for. What that means is that this should have an isolated design where the negative and shield here on the USB connection, which of course, when you hook up to your computer, is the typically the ground of your entire computer, is not connected to the ground on the BNC jacks here. It is not part of the measurement circuit. Typically on a non-isolated oscilloscope, which are most, by the way, including most, most benchtop oscilloscopes like my Rigol, when you connect up the oscilloscope probe, the negative ground lead that is coming off the probe is actually the same as the negative on the entire unit. And if you have a USB port on there and it's not an isolated USB port and it's plugged back into your computer, then everything on your computer is also connected to that ground lead that is on the scope probe. Now there are scope probes that are expensive and they're isolated so that it separates your oscilloscope from what you're measuring. But another avenue to getting an isolated measurement is using a scope like this that has an isolated design. Now you might be asking, why would you even wanna have an isolated scope like that? Well, typically if you're working on something like a Commodore 64, it's not important that you have an isolated scope because you're measuring five volts DC and maybe nine volts or 12 volts AC. 
and the AC voltages that are inside the computer are isolated from the mains or your 120 or 240 volt wall plug using a transformer. So you have an isolation right there. But say the thing you're measuring is not isolated from the mains and you wanna be using your oscilloscope probes to look at the signals on it. A good example of that would be a hot chassis television set which are some of the sets that I've worked on on the channel here. They don't have an isolated chassis design because there's no transformer that is between the electronics and your mains voltage. It's just a simple like dropper resistor regulation circuit. So that means that when you connect your ground probe on your oscilloscope to like the ground point on the TV, that could actually be live at 120 volts, which all of a sudden, if you have it hooked up to a USB scope like this, your entire computer and everything that's grounded on it will be 120 volts. And of course, your computers, if it's plugged in with a three prong plug, is grounded to mains earth, which would be shorting potentially the live chassis of the set to mains earth. If you have a ground fault interrupter breaker, like I do here in the house, it would trip that breaker immediately if you did something like that. But if you don't have those breakers, you could actually cause a full on short circuit that wouldn't just trip the breaker, which could cause a fire, could cause all sorts of damage. You could get a shock. I mean, there's a bunch of things that could happen that could go wrong. So of course, as usual, don't work inside things that are high voltage or live chassis unless you know how to be safe. When it comes to the oscilloscope I'm reviewing, I picked up the isolated version because it was only a little bit more expensive and I actually don't have an isolated scope that could plug into the computer. But for normal people, if you're just gonna be repairing your 64 or your other 8-bit computers and you're gonna be working on the digital logic side of the circuit, you don't need the isolated version and you can buy the cheaper $80 one uh, if you're looking to get one of these scopes. Okay, so back to the scope. I don't even remember the specs of this thing because I bought it a good number of months ago. So let's look at the AliExpress listing here to see what we have. Right off the bat, it looks like it's a 25 megahertz scope, 100 mega samples per second. The competitor scope to this would be the Handtech. I don't remember the model number, but it's like a two channel USB scope that I did review. The biggest problem with the Handtech scope is that it had software based triggering, which pretty much sucked. For super low speeds, it was fine. It was good enough to fix a 64, but the lack of hardware triggering is pretty, pretty limiting with what you can do with that thing. Let's look through the listing here and see if this actually has hardware triggering or not. So there it is, uh, USB isolation. I think this would only be for the isolated version. I'm not 100% sure. It says here it has LAN remote control, but that's optional. Um, I don't know where that would be. There's no LAN port on here, although there's like what, like a knockout there that could be for an RJ45. Here are some specs. Here we have the bandwidth again, 25 megahertz, which is pretty low, but honestly for like a 64 or whatever, that is completely fine. The analog to digital converter is 8-bit, which is completely typical for something like this. It does show that it has various trigger modes, including auto, normal, single, and then edge, pulse, video, slope, and alternate. Again, though, that could all be in software and not in hardware. We'll figure that out pretty quickly when we start using it. It does say here that it's using USB 2.0. I guess the fact that uh, where it's 100 mega samples per second, the, the slow speed there is definitely due to the fact that there is no kind of buffer inside of this thing. The only buffer it has is your computer. So everything is just streamed directly over USB, meaning you're very limited for the amount of bandwidth that you can capture. It says here it has a multifunction interface, uh, which, oh, there's a BNC jack on here that's labeled multi. It says here the input can be used for in, out, pass, fail, but also external trigger input. And that's actually kind of interesting because you could theoretically use that trigger input. So say you're monitoring two different waveforms, like uh, looking at the DRAM signal, and you wanna see what they all look like when the DRAM gets written to. Well, there's a write pin on the DRAM that gets enabled. Well, you could hook up the external trigger input because it's TTL to that uh, write signal. It will trigger, which will capture the waveform at that exact moment. So that could be actually kind of useful. It, it gives you like almost three inputs on the scope, two that are like waveform analysis, and then a third that could just be for triggering, but it has to be TTL, of course. There's the power supply. It says it uses five volts at one amp. So that would be this um, ridiculous cable here. I guess it needs two USB ports or it needs one that can uh, supply an amp, which some of them are gonna be able to, but not all. Uh, power consumption says two and a half watts here and also six and a half watts over here, but there is no over here. <laughs> There's only two columns. Uh, we got some pictures here of the scope. Nothing much to say about that. Oh, yeah, someone testing a power supply, <laughs> okay. 
And I think that's it. It just looks like some shipping stuff. Okay. All right. Before I install the software, I just want to talk about the build quality of this thing. It is metal. So um, that's kind of nice. It's like extruded aluminum or aluminium, as it's said. Uh, it has these like rubber bumper things on here. So I guess that's for a little like shock proofing it. They're on both sides. Underneath, it's just plastic and the writing is on the plastic and it's also on the rubber. So you can uh, see what the ports are and stuff like that. I'm no expert on isolation ratings, things like that. This thing doesn't really say that it's isolated anywhere other than the fact that it has the eye right here, but it does say one mega ohm, 15 picofarads there, which is that have, does that have to do with the isolation rating on this? Or does it have to do with how much load is put on your test signal when you hook up the probe to it um, by the oscilloscope itself? I'm not quite sure. Let's just take a look. So looks, I'm sure we're gonna have very, very inexpensive scope probes that come with this thing. But I mean, for the price, what exactly are you expecting? Uh, this looks like the regular 1X, 10X scope probe. It does say it's 60 megahertz. You know, who knows if that's for real or not. Uh, but you've got all the usual like little rings and stuff for the different channels. This is a typical scope probe. It's got 10X and 1X uh, ground lead. And then you can take off and put on this uh, grabber clip. So you can grab onto sources. Uh, the lead is very flexible and um, yeah, I mean, seems fine. This is probably very, very similar to the scope probes that come with all the other cheap oscilloscopes that I've been reviewing. We have a little manual here with a CD. I'm just gonna get the software installed, but I'm gonna use the software from the internet to get the latest version. Well, the software was pretty easy to find and download and install actually. And it seems to work on Windows XP all the way up through Windows uh, 10, I guess. I'm probably Windows 11 since there's really no difference. I did notice on their website though, there is no Mac or Linux version of the software for this thing. So I don't know if it's, if there's any open source alternative software like there was for the hand tech. So keep that in mind if you are shopping for one of these. As far as the software, it has this uh, little tips window that came up. I don't think I need that anymore. So there's the interface and um, I don't know, like there's no menu bar. So that's a little weird. There's a home button here. Okay, that's, it's almost like it's trying to replicate the interface of uh, actual desktop scope. Well, here it says version five, then VDS 1.1.5. This was downloaded right from Oon's website. So I'm assuming it's the latest version, but the fact is that it runs on XP. I can't imagine it's probably that updated, but the fact that it does run on XP is actually kind of nice. Cause if you have an old like crappy laptop or whatever that can run XP, you can still use it for this scope. It could be the dedicated uh, machine just for that. I'm kind of not loving the fact that this has this weird interface like this with these buttons. All right, well, it has measurements. It does have an XY mode. I don't know if it has a roll mode. It's got like a persistence thing. It's sort of a, a fake persistence thing, but it's something. You can control the grid brightness, so to speak. Obviously this is a holdover from the old days. I'll just leave it in the middle or whatever. Uh, we have our math functions, our FFTs. Math would be like where you're adding one waveform to the other or subtracting one from the other. In fact, um, let's just see what we got here. Yeah, channel one minus or plus, oh, divide or multiply from channel two. You know, the thing that I'm actually noticing that's kind of cool, let's just fix the voltage there. Okay, so the thing that I'm noticing that I'm impressed by actually is that the math is really fast, meaning like it's not slow to update. If I use the uh, math function on my Rigel, like the desktop scope, it's like two, five frames per second, and it's not fast enough. Sometimes I need to use a math function while I'm calibrating disk drives because there's a differential amplifier on there and you gotta uh, subtract the two waveforms. And it's too slow on the Rigel to actually be useful whatsoever. So I have to bust out an analog scope. But this is actually nice and fast. Um, the reason why it was all like super big is because the you can adjust the, the voltage per division and it was, not set appropriately, but there it is, updating very, very quickly. So that's kind of cool. And then the FFT is gonna be using the horsepower of your computer and you can do like a fast Fourier transform. It's really good if you're trying to see like the frequency components of a particular signal. And of course, uh, this is where the benefit of using a PC-based scope actually really shines because doing this also on my Rigol is really, really slow just because that thing, you know, while it's got horsepower, it doesn't have anything like my, you know, Ryzen 5600 that's in the lab PC here. I'm uh, just going through the rest of the settings here. Here's that pass fail stuff. So, I mean, I'm not even gonna bother with this, but you could set stuff up here, like you could create rules and it will turn on that output to say that it passes or fails and could be useful for manufacturing, things like that. We have what looks like a recording capability here. So I suppose you can record your waveforms and then 
I don't know, load them into a, a spreadsheet or something like that. That's kind of interesting. And then here we are back at the settings. So we have a self calibration button. I'm gonna click that. I don't have anything connected right now. Remove all cables and probes. Okay, that's gonna auto calibrate. When this thing powered up, I heard a relay click inside. So that's good. The relay might have to do with like attenuation on the inputs. I just, it's clicking right now. It looks like it passed. It looks like it finished the calibration. It didn't say failed or passed or anything like that, but okay. Anyways, uh, I think the relays that are in here is an improvement from the Hantech scope, which if I recall the Hantech was like $60. So it's like $20 more for this, but potentially you're getting a much better scope, especially if it's got hardware triggering. I think that's kind of the case actually. I didn't really talk about this, but generally Oan and uh, Hantech are like competitors with each other. And Hantech always feels like it's a little bit worse than Oan. Like Oan seems to always make things a little bit better, a little bit more capable for the same or roughly the same money. So this is actually my first time buying Oan. I've just always bought Hantech just because, I don't know, it was just what was there, it was what I realized. But I had lots of comments from people saying that I should try the Oan scope. And well, that's what we're doing right here. All right, I'm gonna connect up a probe here so we can uh, check the uh, little calibration output here. There's like five volt or a one kilohertz output. That doesn't seem to be it. There it is. And they give us a little tool here in this bag to adjust the probe compensation, which is this little uh, adjustment right here. And you can see if I, what do I do with this? Okay, that, oh, okay, that goes back to a menu there. Okay, I guess I gotta click out of that. I don't even know how to use this thing. Uh, how do I drag this around? I'm just trying to make this waveform bigger. No, that's the trigger point. Okay, so that's not triggering. Okay, oh, that's weird. It, right off the bat, I'm not loving the interface because like on all the other ones, like even my virtual bench, but on the high tech one, you can just click and drag the whole waveform around. I just want to bring it down and let's try to turn off this, uh, okay, to turn off the channel two, you got to click it and then click two. Okay, so I clicked on one, I'm trying to drag this. Clicking and dragging doesn't do anything. It's funny, like my little mouse pointer highlighter sort of loses the capability of working while I'm over the Hantech app. So I'm just gonna close it because that doesn't do anything. All right, I double clicked on channel one. Um, so coupling AC or DC. Let's do DC coupling. So that's actually interesting because I don't think the Hantech either, I, I think the Hantech doesn't have any AC coupling. It's only DC coupling. What AC coupling does is it will filter out any DC from your input signal. So say you have a five volt signal that has a waveform on it, setting it to AC will filter out the five volt DC and that means the waveform will be centered around zero volts. So when I just switched it over to DC, you can see that it's no longer triggering anymore because the trigger point is down here. So I gotta move that up. I'm still not seeing how to move the waveform. Ah, here it is. Okay, so I'm looking, unfortunately, the camera that, that's pointing down here blocks part of the screen and it's blocking just the part I was trying to see. All right, so we want this at zero volts. I'm trying to right click, double click, thinking that maybe that'll zero it, but that does not zero it. Okay, whatever. Okay, so what happened here? We just lost triggering. Weird. So that seems like a bit of a bug. Did you see that? trigger point should move with the waveform as I slide it up and down and it had lost triggering. So also what I'm not loving, <laughs> I'm clicking on the waveform and I'm turning my mouse wheel and it's not even zooming in or out. I would expect that turning the wheel would zoom in and out on the interface and it's not doing that. Okay, so, ooh, it's like wobbly, look at that. Ooh, it's like spaghetti. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like this next thing, if I click that, that allows us to like move the waveform up and down. And it's cool that you can hit reset and that resets it. It's the same as dragging this around, but why can't I double click on this to reset it or right click it to reset it or middle click it or something? That doesn't work. And then um, it's measuring one kilohertz, which is correct, but I still don't immediately see how to zoom in and out. Looks like up here in the top corner, we have automatic triggering or, oh no, we have auto set. Run stop, okay, so that's run stop. And I'm assuming this is like a single shot. Let me stop the triggering. Okay, that's a single shot, a little lightning bolt. Okay, weird that it's a lightning bolt, but that works. Overall, this interface isn't super intuitive to me. And believe it or not, the Hantech software is more intuitive and easier to use. Uh, so here's the time base at one millisecond per division. It's down here in the bottom corner. So if I click this, I'm assuming we can switch this. So yeah, we can like zoom in basically. And right here, I think it's 500, what US, is that um, nanoseconds, 500 nanoseconds. And that is not very much at all. Wow. 
we're only looking at a one kilohertz signal here. Imagine if this is a one megahertz signal. <sighs> wow, it would be a thousand times um, closer together. I don't know about the usability of this scope, to be honest. Uh, looks like we can adjust our trigger point, and it does have a reset button, so that's suppose that's nice. Uh, D, this must be like the depth of the capture, so 5,000 points. Yeah, deep memory, it says. And then we have S, 500 kilosamples a second is what we're sampling at right now. I actually thought it had a higher sample rate than this. That's a little bit disappointing. Oops, I just clicked something at the top here and it like resized the window. So triggered, if I click that, I can click disconnect. Why would the trigger button disconnect? That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> what, what, what is that? Why well, have it there? Obviously it disconnects from the USB device itself, but that doesn't even make sense. Let's go back to the home setting here, see if I can speed up the sample rate at all. So single alternative edge triggering. So this is a different triggering, right? Slope, pulse, stuff like that. That's kind of nice. And you can, uh, you can trigger on the rise or fall of the waveform. These are all just normal oscilloscope options, but this seems comprehensive enough. Uh, here's the trigger mode. Looks like you have to go into the settings to change this. So if we go to normal, that will only trigger if the waveform is matching the trigger point. Otherwise, it like freezes the updates. It's good if you have an occasional signal that you just want to look at that signal happening. Then normal won't just like go to a solid line or whatever else is capturing um, while it's not triggering. Now there is a hold off as well, which is useful sometimes. So if you have like a pulse, but you're trying to see something that's later, it can trigger off the pulse and then it holds for the amount of time that you can specify here. It looks like in nanoseconds. Um, I don't know what plus, 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 and plus, plus, plus equals. But anyhow, it can be useful. I mean, typically when you're fixing a 64, though, that's not something you ever need to do. Uh, let's try the measurement here. So this is the measurement capability, frequency, voltage peak to peak, voltage RMS, V max, V min. I kind of like this. It doesn't, you know, there's plenty of room here for all your different measurements and stuff. So I'm digging that. I am really, really digging that. One millisecond, yeah, that's pretty nice. Even though this is like kind of emulating the look of like the, the regular desktop scope, at least these options seem nice. Here are the cursors and looks like you can turn them on. You have to turn them on in here. And actually I can just move this window like off to the side. I know you can't see the capture, but it's it's not overlapping like the main oscilloscope view. So I suppose that's what you would do to like change options. I just don't understand why there's all this blank space down here and those options aren't there. Okay, there are the cursors. Wow, that's really hard to read. It's very dim, but it uh, shows the deltas and stuff like that. So this is good if you're trying to ma measure a waveform um, that it's might, it might not be measuring properly like with this measurement or that measurement. You could do it with this based on the time base. And these cursors are available as well. Uh, that was by turning on voltage. So that works. Alrighty, so in the settings here, there's something called horizontal and I had main assist set. What does this do? I don't even know what that is. And then look at zoom. So zoom actually changed it to 100 mega samples per second. So that's cool. Uh, and you can change the width here. So let's turn this down. Okay, so there's 500. Why do I have to go into the settings to access this? Why can't I just zoom in on the main screen and go to these higher um, sample rates? Like we're at 2.5. If I just go to main, it goes to 500 kilo samples per second. That's just, that's dumb. Oh, this is such a dumb interface. This is really, really dumb. Obviously the zoom, like I click zoom, it actually zooms in on what's between those yellow lines, but this is just stupid. And I can't even drag these lines around. If you could drag them around, maybe that would be good. I really, really don't like this interface. The fact is, let me move this off the screen here. You can't drag stuff around. I can't use the mouse to zoom in and out. It's terrible. That just moves this. If I click inside the waveform window there. So it does look like if we grab this, we can like scroll around the waveform, but okay. Anyways, I think at this point, I need to try to work on a computer to see uh, how this works because it's pretty frustrating <laughs> to be honest, this interface stuff. Let's just fix the uh, probe compensation here. Using the little tool here, we just adjust the little adjustment here. We just want to try to get it as flat as possible. I mean, we're not doing scientific measurements with this thing, so it doesn't really matter. All right, let's move this out of the way and let's grab the Commodore 64. 
So this is the bread bin we're gonna be working on here. And this one is uh, definitely not working, but I haven't done any diagnostics on this at all. This is not one that's been shown on the channel yet. The condition of this computer is pristine. There's a little bit of dust between the keys, but I mean, from a yellowing perspective, this looks like a mint right out of the factory Commodore 64. Looking at the label on the bottom, it does say made in the USA and uh, 21495. So actually the serial number on this matches the box that this came with the original box and it has a matching serial number on it as well. Now we're really up close to the camera and I don't know if it's gonna focus, I think it is, but you can see here that the uh, power connector is a square opening in the case, which is indicative of one of the older C64s. The later ones, like if I look at my Ziff one right there, has a round hole around the DIN connector. And the last thing to look at is the video connector right here. And you can see that it's an eight pin, which means it has the Chroma Luma on it, which is indicative of later 64s, like the ones that have the rainbow label. So this machine's interesting so far because we have the square hole on the side for the power connector, which typically means the older five pin DINs without the Chroma Luma and the gold labels, and yet this thing has sort of the eight pin video, but with the square hole. That's a bit unusual. So let's open this thing up and take a look what we got inside. All right, let's pop the lid. Oh, it's very, very, oh yeah, it was very stuck on there. Disconnect the power LED. All right, and remove the keyboard. There it is, there it is. Well, this is unusual. I am a little surprised by what we're seeing here. This board looks like the original Rev A board, but I don't think Rev A's have the eight pin video connector. So what the heck is going on with that? So right there, you can see assembly number 326298. In addition, you might be noticing right here, got some like rudimentary heat sinks stuck onto both the PLA and the SID chip. Someone has definitely been inside this computer because this is the Dash 03, uh, the kernel ROM, and, and it has a 1986 date code on it, it looks like. So that definitely is later than this computer. And actually looking at the date codes on this computer, it's actually a little bit confusing to me because uh, this up here, which is the color RAM, which is in a kind of an odd position up here, but anyways, 2114 has a 1984 date code. Okay, but then other chips on here, like the 6526 here, has a 52nd week of 1982 day code. And some of these ICs over here have like 48th week of 1982, but then there's 83 chips mixed in, and I see some 84 stuff as well. So really, what kind of strange motherboard is this? It looks like a Rev A board, which should be from 1982, but it's got chips that are soldered down onto it from 1984, and at least from the top, I don't see any signs of rework at all. There's also no evidence that any kind of RF shielding was ever soldered onto this board whatsoever. And definitely along the Rev-A lines, we have, uh, well, it's funny, someone has relocated it here, but basically there normally is a little voltage regulator right here with a little heat sink, and it gets super, super hot. It just has a little inadequate heat sink and like burns your finger. So someone has gone ahead and moved that to the cartridge slot here, using it as a little bit of a heat sink. And actually we can't really tell yet because I'll need to take this board out, but basically it doesn't even look like anyone had desoldered the old um, voltage regulator from the board. So I'm actually thinking that this is a Commodore made computer, like at some point in the, like in the 84, and they use the hodgepodge of stuff. Like maybe this board was lying around and they put in the chips that were missing and they relocated the voltage regulator here. It's time to open up the uh, can here. Let's take a look at what we see inside under here where the VIC is. All right, there it is, a little bit of heat sink compound. Let's get this uh, goop off of here so we can see what kind of chip that is. Yeah, 6567R8. That is a, a, for sure a later revision VIC-2, the one that has like a better picture quality, especially than the earlier ones that was used, that were used on the, these machines. Day code on this is fifth week of 1984, although of course it's in the socket, so someone could have changed this at any point. I wanna take a look under these heat sinks here. They're like stuck on here with some kind of glue. Wow, these are really firmly attached. That has left quite a mess under there. I don't even think I can read the chip. I don't know if these were installed by the factory or if these were put on by a user, 
But let's see if I can clean this up a little bit. This almost seems like it's JB weld that was uh, <laughs> used to stick this down, which is like a two-part epoxy, very strong stuff. And I guess that's pr pretty much <laughs> good enough. It's actually high temperature rated. So, you know, these chips would never get over 100 degrees Celsius anyways. All right, there they are. They're pretty clean now. I had to use this uh, metal scraper here, along with some acetone. I did get off pretty much all that epoxy. This one's the PLA here, and it has a little check mark I can see that someone wrote on here. It's just barely visible. And a 6581 R4 is the actual uh, SID chip, and the SID has a date code of 1986 on it. So again, this machine's like a super hodgepodge of parts from all eras. So I'm gonna pop this out of the case because we need to see if there's been rework. I mean, maybe this machine was like someone's uh, parts queen, you know, like it was their, their machine to put all their chips they had into and make one working machine. That could be what's going on here. But I still don't understand how I have an eight port video connector with Luma Chroma on this particular motherboard. That's completely, completely confusing to me. All right, with the motherboard out of there, the bottom case is like perfect. All the standoffs are not cracked. It looks amazing. There is no yellowing whatsoever. This case is incredible. All right, well, let's look at the back. Oh, there's bodges. Okay, well, that explains, <laughs> that explains how this thing has S-Video. So this has got to be, this has got to be aftermarket, right? This cannot be something the Commodore would do, not this kind of ugliness here. This uh, orange wire here is almost certainly going to be the chroma signal, and I'm not sure what this black wire is for. Now, the thing is, on these Rev A motherboards, the actual RF modulator has only four pins, I think. It doesn't have the right outputs that would normally go from the RF modulator to the chroma and luma signals on the connector. So something's going on with this wire here, and I'll be very curious to see like how good the picture quality is um, with that done. We'll, we'll find out shortly. Now, the rework that's been done here and on the video connector, it's pretty ugly, I gotta say. So that was definitely done by a user. That was not done at the factory by Commodore. They would not have done something that looks this bad. I have my finger on the voltage regulator or where it connects to the motherboard. It looks like it's been reworked as well. Although it's pretty good. Uh, there's little bits of flux like all over the board, but even uh, Commodore motherboards from the factory were like that because some components are actually hand soldered. A lot of them are wave soldered, but there are things that are hand soldered like the connectors and things like that. And there's always a whole bunch of extra flux residue around those. That's completely normal. It also appears that some rework was probably done on this ROM chip. Well, I don't know. On the right side here, this looks pretty ugly. But on the left, everything is fine. In fact, that's sort of what's going on with this board. There's just like little spots here and there where there's a bit of flux where it looks like someone touched it up or something like that. And I don't really get why. And I don't see evidence that entire chips were taken out. But the thing is, um, if it was done a long time ago and the person doing it really knew what they were doing and they had good equipment, it can be difficult to actually see the rework. You know, and looking some more, the little bits of flux that here and there, that, that could have just been someone in the factory touching up the wave soldering that didn't work properly on all areas of the board. And I think they would just visually inspect it and then just manually solder points here and there. Because that's, there, there are little points all over the board that are like that. And that's what kind of makes sense to me. Anyways, flipping this back over, so it does appear that basically someone glued the heat sinks on. I'm thinking someone moved the um, voltage regulator here and then they did this 8-pin mod to, to bring the Chroma Luma out to this port so they would have better image quality. Okay, so we're about to do some testing on this thing. I brought the oscilloscope interface up. I still have it in that zoom mode and notice here 500 nanoseconds is now here and there's all these choices here that are more zoomed in. So you almost have to turn on that zoom mode to even be able to pick these easily enough. I have to say, I don't really understand why it works this way. Anyhow, let's uh, put this down to like 10 and I wanna check the voltage. All right, I think this voltage regulator is for five volts. Um, strangely enough, uh, one of the inputs here and you can just see it here, we're at 1.4, what? Okay, that went way off the scale. What about this other one, the output here? Okay, there we go. So that's five volts. Okay, so we know that that is working properly. All right, I'm on one of the pins here on the video connector and I love how fast it's updating. The update rate is really, really quick. If I move the trigger point down here, let's see, I think this would be like the video signal. 
Oh, but zooming in is going to be a pain. Uh, okay, let's see. One volt per revision. Let's go down to, let's go to 200 millivolts. Okay. And AC coupled. Where do I do AC coupled? Wow, I have to go into this thing here. AC. Okay. Drag this up. Where's the trigger point? Way up there. If I push this trigger button there, that brings up that brings us right to here. So trigger mode, video, and there it is. NTSC PAL C cam line field line number. So let's do field. Uh, we can set the hold off. It certainly doesn't seem to be triggering on anything, does it? Actually, we might be looking at chroma information here now that I think about it. Okay, maybe that's the composite. Yep. So see how it like is low for a little while and then it pops up. That would be like the video signal. And then right here, that's like one of the borders, one of the borders. So I guess it is actually triggering right now. All right. So now we are looking at one single scan line. So basically this is the horizontal pulse, sync pulse right there. We have a color burst. Then that is the border. So how the luma le level is higher for the border. Oops, I, I came off the pin. Sorry. Get back on there. So that's the border, the luma level's higher there, and then on the background where you have the text and stuff, then it's lower. But of course, you're gonna see occasional higher because I don't think it's synchronizing to a line. It's, it's synchronizing to a line, but it not, doesn't let us pick a specific line. Uh, odd feel, oh, line number, here we go. Is that gonna work? Nah, that doesn't work. Oh, it does work. Okay, let's try to pick a line specifically. We gotta get up, okay, whoa! So this is uh, triggering on one single line of video. <laughs> okay, that's pretty cool. So on line 14, first few lines were blank. That's why there was nothing there. So there's color burst, and then we have the top part, which is just the solid border. Now you see the waveform there. That's because the NTSC color is encoded into there. If we looked at the Luma signal, that would just be flat. But as we go down, we're going to see that solid border disappear because it's going to have where the text is and it should drop down. Let's see where that happens. There it is, so it dropped down. Now, as we keep going, if there's text visible, there it is, the text is right there. So that's the actual uh, scan line and it's showing the text. So we can validate without even a monitor that this computer is actually probably working here. Now, if we hooked up a keyboard and we actually type something, if we could, could type anything, we could clear the screen and we'd actually see those little bumps go away. Let me try to find the Luma signal here. If I can get on the Luma line, I guess that is the Luma line. The signal level is really, really low though, compared to the composite signal, which is this one right here, where there's a good amount of signal there. In fact, uh, let's look at what we're seeing here. So peak to peak is 944 millivolts, which is about right, one volt peak to peak is typical. But if we look at this, what is the Luma? Because clearly it is, because we're seeing the uh, sync pulse there and then the border, and then there's that text I was talking about. But it, we're at 168 millivolts, that's not enough. So hooking a monitor up to this computer, up to the, the Luma and Chroma, this is just not gonna work. This signal right here, I'm gonna say, is actually the Chroma signal, and it looks correct. Like, the amplitude is enough, and that should produce a decent um, picture if you had it hooked up to a monitor. It's just that the Luma signal is not correct. I don't even know if the monitor is gonna show anything with it being this low. Okay, so let's go back to one volt per division, and I'm gonna change the triggering. Oops, I think I turned off the triggering. Here it is, triggering, channel one. We're gonna switch this to edge. We're gonna switch this to rise. And uh, let's just look at some of the lines on the CPU here. We're on one volt per division, one, two, three, four. So we're about four volts. Uh, it's sort of all over the place, but that's understandable. Uh, let's change this to zoom in a little bit more. All right, so that signal looks really good. This is, um, I don't even know, it's one of the address lines, I think. Oh, actually, look, we're on AC. Ground, DC. Oh, okay, you can switch that by just clicking right here. All right, so if I turn the computer off and we turn it back on again, okay, yeah, and like, wow, the update rate is really, really fast. Let's go one more, let's, oh, we can zoom in even more and it's still triggering perfectly. Uh, the trigger point is in a weird space though. Uh, how do I get this fixed? Uh, let's see here, reset. Uh, set 50%. So right now we're looking at a waveform that's like way off to the side to get it. So like see the little arrow right there and to drag it over, it's a pain. I think you can go here and hit reset. And there we go. Now we're looking at what's triggering. Okay, so right off the bat, the 
Update rate of the waveform is incredibly fast. That's nice. The triggering seems to work really well. The video triggering obviously was working. We saw it working. And it's having no problem at all triggering here at 100 mega samples per second. I mean, we can still keep zooming in um, like to the waveform there. And look at that. It's running at a full on 60 frames per second. That is far better than that um, Hentec USB scope that I reviewed. But the problem is here is what I've already talked about, and it's the software. The interface is freaking horrible. It's so hard to use and super unintuitive. I guess not necessarily worse than what you'd get on a desktop scope, but that's got knobs that you can remember, like memorize where they are. So if you need to change the time base, you just reach and turn. Here, you have to go, I guess, here, and then there's this stupid, you know, scroll up and down. You can use your mouse wheel and then you can you can do it. But there isn't even like an up and down arrow to click on to just change it. Okay, you know what? Look at that. When I hover that, okay, so <laughs> as I learned this, it's a bit better. If you hover over it and you use the mouse wheel, it does change. But why doesn't it just do it if I hover over the waveform here? Like that does nothing to the mouse wheel, but here it actually does. Okay, that's a little bit better. And what about this? That doesn't change anything. Display is not clickable anyways, nor is that. Uh, how about here, one volt for division? Okay, look at that. You can use the mouse wheel on this too. Wow, <laughs> that is not intuitive. Not intuitive at all. I do like the performance. Like that is a really good, sharp, clear waveform. Oh, you know what we should do? Let's take a look at the clock signal because that should be faster. What is this here? Here it is, 1.022 megahertz. All right, uh, yeah, that looks pretty good. Uh, let's change this. So I don't know what's up with this little like slow rise here. That could be that could be actually the processor. That might be the phi out because looking here, uh, this is one of the data or address lines. It looks nice and square. So the clock signal, on the other hand, yeah, it's a bit roly poly. But let's check the other side. I think, uh, there it is. That's the clock input. I think 1.022 megahertz. So it's interesting because it has a frequency counter down here. And I wonder if that's a hardware counter versus the software counter right here. Ugh, I was trying to zoom in and out again. I got to go over here to do that. So yeah, still, we're looking at a good signal. Now over here is like a clock generation circuit, I think. And if we poke around, we should be able to find something faster. So four megahertz. So the frequency counter is working. Oh, so is that one actually. Let's zoom in on this. Okay. It's triggering, but the clock cycle, as you can see, it's getting longer and shorter, which I guess is just what happens. I don't think I've ever looked at that particular pin before. Here's a six megahertz clock. It's doing the same thing, but it's triggering really nice. And it's also very clear and sharp. And here we go. This is the 14 megahertz clock. This is what's coming off the crystal. There's a little bit of circuitry that makes it um, you know, sharper and better, but yeah, there it is. So that's the crystal oscillator, 14.316. So this one must be a hardware counter and it's um, that looks more accurate than that one. Now remember this scope's only spec to run at 25 megahertz, but that looks like a good waveform there. I mean, it's not squared off or anything. And if we zoom in some more here, you know, it's jiggly and whatnot, but it's triggering. It's got a nice rock solid trigger. And I'm thinking that the softness of this is just due to the fact that the front end of the scope is not designed for high frequencies. This is plenty good though for you to tell uh, what the input frequency is. In fact, if we zoom out here to something that would be impossible for it to measure the frequency, there it is with the question mark, this is still measuring 14.316 megahertz. That definitely implies that what you have in the box right here is a hardware counter, and that one there is just uh, part of the measurement, which would be software based. Alrighty, well, um, right off the bat, um, you know, back to this computer, I thought this thing was bad, and I think it's because when I tested it, I plugged it in with a, low, a Luma Chroma, like S-Video type cable into the video connector. And clearly that Luma signal, we saw it was way too low for any kind of monitor to sync on. So it wouldn't even lock onto the sync signal, I don't think. Therefore, you would just get no image whatsoever. It does appear that this computer is working. Like there is definitely normal activity happening here on the CPU. And if we turn it off and on, yeah, this looks quite normal. Now, just because we saw on the video output, on the composite, we saw what looked like a border and you know text and stuff, that doesn't mean that this is actually working. So let's plug a monitor in and let's take a look. All right, the RetroTink is connected here. So if we turn this on and I have the uh, VIC-20 cable here, so that's the composite video cable. 
There we go. I am in the wrong mode. There it is. So this is actually a working computer. <laughs> this doesn't even need a repair. I only thought it did because it has a non-functional Luma output. So it tricked me into thinking that it wasn't working. Let's plug the keyboard in and we'll see if we can actually type some stuff on here. Ah, uh, yes, you know, I think the other problem with this computer is the LED doesn't work. Let me turn this on. Oh, it does work. I swear the other day when I turned this on, I didn't even see um, anything on the light and I put on the note, bad power switch with a question mark. Hmm, the light is very dim, but that's just because it's one of the very old <laughs> LEDs that are <laughs> not very efficient. Alrighty, there it is. The image is quite dark, and I think that's indicative of these Rev-A motherboards. You have to like do a resistor mod over here in this area, like to one of the transistors or whatever, and that makes a much brighter image. Um, yeah, because this this looks quite dim, but maybe it's gonna work. Let's put the... Okay, well, you know what? I can't plug an easy flash in. If we do, it's gonna result in a non-working computer, but we can try. So easy flash is in. What's gonna happen is we should get the splash screen, but as soon as we try to start it, uh, it's gonna, yeah, do that. That's normal for these Rev-A motherboards as well. I know there's actually a fix you can do to try to fix that, but let's grab the Kung Fu Flash here and we'll use that. I think this works better with these particular machines. Maybe, maybe not, not actually sure. Yeah, it looks like it went into the last game that I was running and normally you push this button to exit out and go like select something else and that doesn't work. <laughs> okay. What if I hold that down while I turn it on? Does that like abort the, the loading? There it is. But as soon as I let go, it does that. I don't think that this cartridge is compatible um, either with this early machine. These Rebe motherboards, there are several fixes you have to do and that makes them work better with uh, more modern things but we can definitely run the diagnostic cartridge on here and I can plug in the test harness. Also interesting is the heat sink, or not the heat sink, what well, is now the heat sink, which is the shield for the RF, uh, for the cartridge, is definitely getting warm. So it's definitely transferring the heat from this transistor into this. Now I'd be afraid from like a really long session that like it might melt your cartridge or something because it could get up to like 80 degrees Celsius or something. Uh, so far so good. I guess I should grab the test harness and we'll see if this machine is fully functional. But, you know, to be honest, as is usual, Rev-A motherboards are actually very reliable motherboards. And to be honest, one of the problems is actually the voltage regulator just gets super hot. So this little fix that someone did is a really good solution. Also, the thing about the Rev-A's is they have very, they seem to have very clear video output. Now, that is totally dictated by the RF modulator, really. So I think it's just the circuitry is better in there. And if you use one of the modern replacements like uh, Mark at the Retro Channel, it just came out with a very modern, good replacement RF modulator circuit. I think that would result in a really great image on any of them. But th it looks really nice here. Like, I mean, it's composite and it's a little dim, but the text is clear. It's not bleeding, stuff like that. So anyways, let me grab the harness. All right, test harness is connected. Power this up. This is my newer harness sent, sent in by viewer Mike. Thank you very much, Mike, for that. Uh, the old one I had sort of fell apart, uh, was unreliable. This one, on the other hand, seems to be very reliable. I want to point out, by the way, that the connectors on this board, it was, it's funny, there's an LED on there. I don't know why. Uh, the connectors, like the edge connectors on this board are very, very clean. This machine was kept in a dry, nice place. It was not left out in the damp, out in the garage or whatever. So. From a corrosion perspective, this thing is in amazing shape. Ah, what I don't have is a speaker hooked up. And you know what? Because I don't have Easy Flash working. Um, oh, control port bad. What? Really? So what that one is, is telling us, uh, because it says the SID is bad, that's the paddle ports. So the paddles, unlike the rest of the joystick inputs, go through the SID chip. And it's telling me there that it is not working. Let's push the SID down. Why don't we plug in the speaker anyhow, because there might be no sound and that just could be a totally dead SID. All right, there's a bit of a buzz on the SID. If I looked at the speaker, I can hear it, but it's super, super faint. And I have the speakers turned up quite, quite loudly and there's a lot of buzz on them. The, the noise channel is working fine, but the other sounds are very, very faint. And uh, okay, so uh, my assumption here is that this SID, unfortunately, it was not good. So what I'm going to do is I'll pop in a different one and let's just make sure that that control port error comes back. Because, you know, whatever failed in here, 
It could be that the portion of the chip that does the paddles is also bad. I borrowed the SID chip out of my Ziff machine because I didn't have a 6581 handy. All right, let's turn this back on. The sound out of the speaker now just sounds like the normal SID noise. It's kind of like, a, you can almost hear like the video signal coming through or like, you know, whatever clock signals or refresh signals or whatever it is. The other one was more like a weird buzzing sound that didn't sound normal. Ah, it's still showing as bad. Okay, so control port still shows as bad, but the music is working now. All right, so that other SID is definitely, this, this one is definitely bad. Um, but you notice that it no longer says the 6581 is bad. So the paddles or whatever are working. But it's saying that um, the 4066, which is a CMOS like switch chip, which is uh, down here, is bad. You know, I've had this issue before where that is like claimed is the problem. I think that is actually a bug with the diagnostic on this particular revision of the motherboard. If we play a game, and I do have a copy of uh, what, Zaxxon, Super Zaxxon right here. So we can try this out. This is a normal cartridge. We'll see if that works and I'll plug a joystick in and I bet you the joystick is gonna work. Definitely this said, because it said control port was bad, that would be the paddles and now that is fixed. So let's just double check one more time that it still shows as bad. Okay, look, it's actually good now. So all I did was like jiggle the, the connectors like on the edge connectors and the joystick port and now it's working. So there we go, fully operational machine except for the fact that it said it did not survive uh, whatever the sleep that this computer had. All right, I'm gonna leave this thing running the diagnostic and let's just probe around a little bit more on the motherboard with the oscilloscope just before I give my final conclusion on this thing. So we're looking at one of the pins here on the PLA and if we zoom out, you can see that, you know, there are little breaks there. And the fact is that it has a very fast refresh rate or update rate for the waveforms, we're able to see that pretty clearly. Let's go to the next pin. That well, looks the same. Okay, there we go. So again, you have to go over this uh, W here to zoom in and out. So there we go on this pin. We're getting a you know a pretty good waveform there. This must be like I have a pull-up resistor on whatever this line is. That's why it kind of slowly fade you know fades up. It's not like a hard up. But while using this software, if you remember that you just have to kind of go over the uh, time base and then use the wheel to zoom in and out, that is actually not horrible. I think I might just crash the computer by touching two legs together on the PLA. Let's turn it off and on. Okay, so why is it not triggering properly here? Oh, I have it on normal. So what has to happen when it's not triggering because the signal's just high all the time, then what you get is it just sort of looks like it freezes like that. That is normal for the normal mode. <laughs> okay, on a different pin here. And again, really nice looking waveform there. No issues, really fast, really clear. And here's another one there, just a random pin. Uh, see, I was zooming up on the middle of the waveform again. That does not work. Yeah, you can zoom out. You can kind of see patterns and stuff. And if we turn the computer off and on, there you go. Here it is, persistence. So if we do half a second, so there you go. That's, that's what the persistence looks like. It can allow you to see little glitches and things. I mean, as you can kind of see here, well, it's potentially useful in that regard. If we zoom in and out, it gets a little hard to see when you zoom out. But if we zoom in, um, yeah, you can kind of see these little things here that if I turn off the persistence, well, that's just clear. If we turn it off, then you have to just use your eyes to kind of see those waveforms. But obviously if we set it to one second or, you know, infinite, looks like it's pretty slow, the update rate when you have it on infinite. Actually, infinite's interesting because it's still fading away. <laughs> that doesn't seem infinite to me. <laughs> infinite should be like, forever drawing, but um, five seconds, 2.5. So anyways, I just wanted to see how that looked and um, yeah, it looks fine. All right, so there you have it. That's the Oan, uh, what is this? VDS1022. And I happen to have the isolated version, but really uh, if we're going for cheap scope, just buy the non-isolated version because with your Commodore 64, there'll be no problem at all using it. The interface on the software is infuriating. If they just added some nice features like using the wheel to zoom in and out, that would be so appreciated. Now that I figured out that I could like hover over certain areas on the software and zoom in and out, 
it's a little easier to use. And I think once you kind of use it enough, you'd get used to those idiosyncrasies. But I really feel it shouldn't be so obtuse and require such precision as to like move over a tiny little area to then use the wheel. Like you should be able to do it over the waveform itself, which is how every other USB scope I've ever used works, including the virtual bench and the Hantech software. The Hantech software though is bad in other ways, but from a UI perspective, it's a little easier to use or a little more intuitive. That's, that should be the word. From a capability standpoint though, this scope is a million times better. And for what was it, $80? I'm mighty impressed. I didn't even try the second channel. It's there. I didn't even try the isolation, but you know, it should be there, I guess. But the fact is it's got that incredibly fast update rate. It's got really good triggering that actually works. And that video triggering worked. I was able to trigger on a certain scan line and it worked. We were able to see that there were letters on the home screen before I even plugged a monitor into it. I'm honestly really impressed. If they just improve the user interface on the software to make it a little easier to use, instead of that, that floating window, maybe drop down menus or more buttons or something, I would be really, really happy to use this. In fact, I would be totally happy to use this scope all the time instead of the virtual bench. Now, of course, how does this compare to the other scopes that I've been reviewing on the channel lately? I'm gonna say that this thing is far better than the Handtech uh, USB scopes. I have had two of them, one that looked very similar and one was like a pen scope. Both of those were primitive in comparison to this. This thing is far, far superior to those. Now, how does this thing compare to the battery operated scopes I've had on the channel recently? Well. The last one I did, which I forgot the name of it, to be honest, and I actually can't remember where I placed it right now, so I can't even hold it up, but it's yellow and it was cheap. It was like $57. That thing was incredibly capable for the price. It had a bunch of fake specs, but if you're gonna use it for like 20 megahertz or less, actually really quite good. Now, how does it compare to this Handtech scope, which I reviewed quite a while ago on the channel? I'm gonna say they're, they're very similar. I think this has a little bit higher bandwidth. Uh, this is definitely more expensive. This is like 100 and $30, something like $140. The thing is the user interface on this kind of sucks as well. I know Oan makes a version of these battery powered scopes, which is very similarly capable to this. And I think has a nicer user interface and a slightly bigger screen and stuff like that. I'm gonna say that like USB scopes and these handheld scopes don't really occupy the same exact space. The fact is when you're doing troubleshooting on a computer like I'm doing here, having a really large screen on the computer is actually beneficial to me. And honestly, being able to use the mouse to quickly change the time base and stuff like that is also far easier than just fiddling around with the stupid buttons on these things. All right, so my recommendation, if you haven't bought an oscilloscope yet and you're looking for a USB scope to work on things like Commodore 64s, like 8-bit computers that are not too fast, would this be a good scope? Would I give it my thumbs up? I'm gonna give it like mostly a thumbs up. It's definitely not lying about what it can do. It is fully capable, it's a nice scope. It's just the software. What junk, they just need to fix that, <laughs> make it easier to use, and then I'd be able to full wholeheartedly give it a full thumbs up. So that is gonna be it for this video. I do apologize that this Commodore 64 was not actually broken. What an interesting specimen. I was really thrown for a loop that this had a Rev A motherboard in it with that eight pin connector on the back. And like I said, I plugged in a Luma Chroma cable into there, which doesn't work because the Luma signal is not strong enough. I don't think there's any way for me to easily fix the Luma signal on this thing. I think what I'm gonna have to do is just take that eight pin off and put a five pin back on there to kind of restore this back to the way it was so that people don't get tricked and think that you could use a Luma Chroma cable like I did and you end up with no image. I'd like to thank my patrons. Their names are scrolling off the side of the screen. All my patrons get early access to my videos, usually about a week in advance, so it gets a chance for you to see it, comment on it before the general masses do. And the higher tiers also get special access to like behind the scenes pictures and occasional video clips and things like that. Not to mention, I'm thinking about doing a live stream. Now that I have this PC all set up with like multiple inputs and stuff like that, I really wanna try and do a live stream so I can talk to my patrons. And yeah, that'll be for the higher tiers as well. And comment down below if you have thoughts about this thing and I'll put links in the description to buy this thing if you're interested and you know, all the usual stuff. So uh, thanks very much for watching. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you next time. Bye.